They are in listen only mode. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the health and safety briefing in its new digital format. I'm Jenny and I'll be coordinating the session. Uh, before we start, just a couple of points to draw your attention to. Uh, we are recording the webinar and we will send a link directly to you by email. Uh, throughout the session, we've got some polling questions. When you see the voting questions on your screen, just simply select and submit your answer. We also have time at the end for questions. If you do have any questions, uh, just pop them in the chat box at any time and we'll put them to Chris at the end. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce our presenter, Chris. Chris Newson is a qualified mechanical engineer and a chartered fellow of the Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Chris has worked closely with our Westminster team to give you the most up-to-date information on COVID-related government policy and guidance and the practical implications to you and your organisation. Uh, I now pass over to Chris to begin this session. Thank you, Jenny, and welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, thank you for, for giving up your time today to, to listen to what we've got to say. Um, in terms of an agenda, really there's there's a couple of points. Um, first half, the, the webinar is split into two points, two halves. First one is, as Jenny talked about there, uh, a policy update. And what we're going to absolutely focus on is, is COVID-19 and uh, no surprising, no surprise there, of course, and the government guidance that uh, was released uh, recently and how we're interpreting that for our members, um, because clearly that's that's important. Uh, and I will talk briefly about the future EU-UK relationship uh, as well. Um, and then I will move on to, as we usually do in these member briefings, to give you a legal update. Uh, and that might not be where minds are focused at the moment, but I think clearly it's important to maintain CPD, whether you're a health and safety professional or a senior person or anyone else to see and to hear what is actually going on uh, or what was going on in the legal world. So I'm going to talk about a case, uh, HSE versus uh, Company D, and really how that is affected by the sentencing guidelines. So that's our agenda uh, for today. Um, at this point, uh, I'm going to pass over to Jenny for our first poll. Thanks, Chris. Yes, so for our first poll, uh, we would like you to tell us, um, are any org UK sites in your organisation currently open? Just select one answer. Yes, no or not sure. And I'll give just a couple of minutes for people to submit their answers. That's great. Thanks. So let's look at what the results are. That, well, that's really interesting. Yeah. So, uh, Chris, we've got 89% still have UK sites open, 8% uh, don't, and 2% uh, not sure. Uh, would that come as a surprise to you, Chris? Not, not at all, Jenny. Uh, and that's it's good that that sort of mirrors what what Make UK think is happening. Uh, it's a real confidence note there. Uh, I think the, the view outside, if you're not in manufacturing, the view outside is that everywhere's closed and all the shutters have come down. And actually, the reality we know from our membership is that a lot of companies have remained open as much as they can and, and put in place, even before this guidance came out, measures um, to, to control what's happening. So not a surprise at all. Um, what I would say is that with those 89% and what we're going to talk about today, the government guidance, uh, the recent government guidance, doesn't matter whether you're in that 89% or, or whether you're not, uh, you have to put these, it's sensible to put these measures in place. But no, I, I'm not surprised by that, but I think people that don't know manufacturing probably would be. Um, so, okay, thank you very much for that, Jenny. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk now really around the government guidance and, and that poll demonstrated there actually that companies have carried on uh, in business. Um, we understand why that is um, and, and sort of made their own decisions. Now there is government guidance. A lot's been said about it, but I, I'm going to talk through it in detail uh, for you. So um, at the top line there talks about many manufacturing sites being temporarily closed. Uh, our poll shows you know, depends what you think many means, but a lot have remained open actually. Um, on the 11th of May, not very long ago, the government released guidance. Um, and the, the idea of that guidance was it was around helping people return to work, helping companies get back to business again. But as we know by the poll, a lot of companies are carrying on. 
maybe not in exactly the same uh, number of people way or the same efficiencies, but they were carrying on. So this certainly opens up the doors in terms of what else you can do. Um, but really important here, and I, I know you all know this, but I just repeat it. The overriding message is that if you can work from home, you should continue to work from home. Uh, if you can't work from home, you should go to work, but only go to work if you can do that safely. Uh, and so hopefully that's clear and concise. That is the situation. The really important thing here though is if you're gonna bring people back to work, one of the issues you will have to deal with is in, as employers is confidence. You will have to give them confidence that they can return to work safely. Um, and whether you've been open or not, as I said, it might be bringing the rest of your workforce back in. And so confidence is, is a massive point. Let's be encouraging people to bring back to work, uh, to come back to work rather than managing it in any other way, I think. Um, nothing's changed in terms of the law. Let's just remember that. The guidance is guidance. It's not legally binding. It is good guidance. It's there for you to follow, uh, but it is not legally binding as guidance never is. Um, the duty is, is always and will always be on the employer to ensure the workplace is safe. So uh, you have to follow the guidance and make sure, well, you have to work, make sure the workplace is safe. The guidance is there to help you. Okay. Um, there are eight guides, um, much like the approach the HSE take. This wasn't from the HSE, but much like the HSE approach uh, with fire, for example, there's different guides depending on what sort of establishment you're in. And so you can see a list of eight different uh, establishments or types of risk. I'm not gonna read through that. Uh, but what I am gonna talk about here, because of uh, we are who we are, we represent manufacturing and our membership, we believe want to know about these, is I'm gonna talk about factories, plants and warehouses and offices, shops, uh, sorry, offices and contact centers. So those are the two guides that I'm really gonna focus on. Um, but look, you know, what I would also say is all of the eight guides have eight common sections. And so um, the headings in all of them are the same, much like, again, fire legislation. Um, the details are slightly different under each one. There's more content in certain sections, depending on what guide you're reading. But each guide has the eight sections. And, and perhaps if you read through those eight sections, um, not much of a surprise uh, there. If you haven't seen the government guidance, um, which uh, you know I think probably is unlikely, but if you haven't seen it, we are going to share the hyperlink after this webinar, so you can go straight to it if you want to. But they all, all of them follow those eight uh, key steps that are there. Now I'm going to talk about those eight steps. Some parts in quite a lot of detail, and some not. I'm not going to waste time talking about things you probably know all about. Let's start with risk assessment, and you might say, well, here's an opportunity to, to go quickly because we know all about this already. Um, yeah, uh, hopefully we know about risk assessment. We know there are the HSE model here is, is the basic five step model. The point I want to make here is the guidance, first of all, is crystal clear. Point one, think about risk. You must have a risk assessment in place. Uh, the guidance says that. I said earlier on, it's not the law. But as you'll know, the law already says from a very long time ago, you must have a risk assessment if you have significant hazards. I think this is a significant hazard, so we need a risk assessment in place. The key word I would use here is specific. It's not your general risk assessment. Don't do a risk assessment and, and include one line that says COVID-19. You know, you've got to have a specific overarching risk assessment for uh, the, this crisis that we're facing. And so I just want to talk about the different steps here for you. So when you think about identifying the hazard, you can talk about COVID-19 being the hazard. Um, that's going to be a very short risk assessment and not really give you the coverage that you need to ensure people feel safe, which is the point I was making at the beginning. So when we're talking about identifying the hazards, um, I think we need to think about things like contact with objects, contact with people, uh, you've got, uh, perhaps you've got eating, drinking facilities. Uh, how are you going to manage those? Now, it could all be in one document. You might want three documents. It doesn't matter, but you must cover all of the hazards that are presented by COVID-19 in your workplace. Uh, the next part, again, is usually straightforward, but carries more significance at, at this time. So step two is who can be harmed and how. 
Um, and, and you'll have seen this before, look, employees, visitors, vulnerable persons, okay. The vulnerable persons part now has more significance than it ever has. We know that the government uh, uh, guidance, not, not the guidance I'm talking about here, but other government guidance talks about different risk classifications of people, people that are self-isolating because they have symptoms, people that are protecting uh, uh, high people that are at high clinical risk, so they might be staying at home for that reason. And then, of course, you've got people that have underlying health conditions, and you've got people that are at a high, uh, even higher clinical risk. What you must do here is understand which of those groups your employees sit in, sit in, and therefore what you must do about it. Now we get some questions about things like temperature chest testing and health surveillance and is, is it my job to find out whether people have, have got are infected or whatever it might be well in the uk at the moment temperature testing isn't recommended um, other countries it is it isn't in the uk at the moment um, so what you have to rely on is people telling you what their situation is so you must keep an open dialogue um, and make it very clear what the risk groups are and very clear that they should tell you uh, what their situation is. Nothing's changed here, uh, actually, uh, but you probably have to remind your employees that it is their job to keep you up to date with their health condition. So that's how that is, should be managed at the moment. Okay, I'm not going to spend very long on evaluate the risk and control because at the end of the day, use whatever storage system you like, five by five, three by three, high, medium and low. That's not really the point here. Um, you, you, I wouldn't reinvent the wheel if you've got a system that everyone recognizes at your company, carry on using that. I move on then to something which is very important here, and, and that is record. And so I know you know that you have to write down a risk assessment because it's the law and you may be required to show it to people. Uh, and by that, I mean external people here. Um, but that's not the point I want to make here. If you put lots of effort into doing a good risk assessment. The aim here is not to tick a box that it's the law, but it is to make sure that your employees, your staff, your, your teams are confident in either returning to work or carrying on work as they are. And, and the risk assessment is the tool to do that. So risk assessment is a demonstration of you thinking about the hazards and putting controls in place. Why wouldn't you then share it with your employees? So you must absolutely share it getting them involved, um, whether it's through union representation or whether you've got non-union safety reps, get them involved in the process. That makes, as, as you know, any change management, which is what we're talking about here, easier. Get them involved as early as you can. Um, and very simply, it's not very complicated, this. Um, if you can show people these are the hazards, these are the risks, these are the controls we've got to put in place, we have put in place, then it builds up what we're calling the culture of confidence because that is your biggest barrier of bringing people back to work or, or allowing them to carry on work is confidence, their confidence in, in, in how the company is managing their safety. Um, so the culture of confidence, I'll talk about that a bit later on, but you, you really, you know, think about why you're doing risk assessment. It's to keep your employees safe. That is the reason, that's it. So you should share it with me. Um, next point is around review. So uh, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know here. I think this crisis is fast moving. It change, changes all the time as new scientific evidence is coming out. The government tells us quite a lot. There are other sources that we can look at like the uh, World Health Organization. So it's, it's ever changing, fast moving, uh, and therefore your risk assessment must be current. So, if it, don't think that you're going to do a risk assessment and then that's it. It needs to be kept under review almost on a, I mean, a, difficult to suggest a scale, a, a, a frequency, but almost on a weekly basis, certainly very, very regularly. Um, okay, so um, that's think about risk. You know, the, the, the key overriding um, uh, principle here, let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's use a model we're familiar with. Um, second one, I'm not going to spend too long on, the, on these. Who should go to work? So. The government has talked about these different risk groups, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, and really just repeating what I said here, you must understand what group, what classification, what group your workforce is in, but it is their job to tell you that. Um, and, and then you can manage things. And what I mean by that is, if people are self-isolating, then they need to continue doing that. 
if people have pre-existing medical conditions, so they're at a, a higher clinical risk, then they can come back to work, but you need to treat them as a vulnerable person. What I mean by that is putting some, in, some additional controls in place. Um, so you need to understand what their current situation is. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's their duty to tell you that, but you might need to just remind them. Okay. Uh, so part three, I'm really not gonna say a lot about this because I think we've heard enough about social distancing. But if you think about the risk assessment that I mentioned, and you think about hierarchy of control, social distancing is not the top, clearly it's not eliminate, but it's somewhere in the middle. It, it's a good control. The science says that it's a good control. Um, difficult to implement, I know that, um, but the overriding principle of point three is this two meter gap. A couple of examples there uh, of where companies have put in place the two meter rule. We've seen lots of examples here. You've also got things like uh, um, barriers, shields, uh, in terms of workstations. Uh, and so I think we all un understand uh, all of that. So social distancing, there's quite a lot in the guidance about it, but you're not going to find specific detailed pictures. Um, but if you follow that two meter rule where you can. The point that I would make here is that it, it, it doesn't say if you can't maintain two meters, you can't do the job. It doesn't say that. It, sh it says social distancing is is in the middle of the hierarchy, that should be one of the first things you look at because you can't eliminate. Um, social distance is somewhere there. Uh, it's certainly more effective than things like PPE. So this is what you should be looking at first. A lot of, uh, a lot of stories we hear, uh, and again, nothing's changed here. This is just normal health and safety, is people are thinking about PPE as the first thing. Social distancing is many more times effective than PPE. So that's where we should be uh, uh, aiming our um, are thinking. Of course, it's difficult to implement and keep in place, I know that, but that's where we should be aiming. Um, so that leads us nicely on to uh, personal protective equipment. And once again, I don't want to say too much here. The government guidance and all the science that's come out around personal protective equipment, say, and, and the first part here is from the guide. Um, and basically, to summarize this, PPE, dust masks, respiratory protective equipment, it's not very effective against this, this virus. Um, there's a huge misunderstanding that PPE is really a good idea. It's not very effective against this, uh, this contamination, this virus. So you know, PPE, therefore, apart from getting people to wear it and wear it properly, that's a problem. PPE actually is right down the bottom of the hierarchy here. And, and add to that, of course, we've got this issue about there are people that are in clinical settings. So I'm thinking about the NHS uh, uh, here that really, that is where it's useful because that's a very high risk situation. Um, social distancing, hygiene, keeping people in fixed teams, uh, minimizing the number of people involved, much more effective than PPE. So please think about that before you get to think about PPE. Um, the government also recently of, um, uh, in, in the guide talked about something called face coverings. So face coverings are not PPE, the government have actually put out guidance on how you can make face coverings, um, and they are um, as effective uh, in, in certain situations as the PPE because of the nature of this virus. So if social distancing, think about that first, but if you have to have people working together um, less than two meters, there's lots of things you can still do. Don't face each other, um, be back to back or side to side, uh, regular breaks, regular hygiene, uh, practices. Face coverings, uh, not PPE, face coverings are another option. But again, right down the bottom of the hierarchy. And of course, I think we probably all know this because it gets a lot of publicity. The face covering doesn't protect you, it protects people around you if you've got the virus. It, you know, it, it doesn't filter anything out. So that's, that's what I want to say about PPE. Really important that we understand the science behind it. Um, if your employees, the guidance says, if your employees want to wear face coverings, then you should support them in wearing one. Now, what that means is um, if they want to wear one, then let's make sure it's a proper one. Let's make sure it follows the guidance that's out there in terms of making them. Uh, let's make sure proper hygiene practices are in place when taking them on and off. So that's PPE. Um, the most important part after risk assessment, maybe, and I said that was the most important part already, but 
really important this workforce management now what we mean by that i talked about this earlier on is the culture of confidence that's what we make uk are calling it the biggest barrier you have perhaps to people coming back to work or to carrying on work as they are now is confidence they are there's fear they're scared there's a, there's a lack of understanding perhaps and so this culture of confidence model uh, that we've created to help our membership we really believe that it, um, it, it it will help you bring back people safely or allow them to carry on so the four stages to it, it it's not very complicated but it really i think it's important to get your mind around thinking in this way the first thing is competence and control very simple look what i mean by that you must have someone that is has a read the guide and b has um has been able to interpret it for your organization so i'll say that again you must have someone in your organization and maybe use an external health and safety consultant okay but there must you must have somebody that has the competence uh, that has read the guide sorry and that has the competence to interpret it and it doesn't matter whether it's an employee or whether it's someone external but you must be getting that competent advice that's there i know and you know it's the law already to have competent health and safety advice but it's more important at this point than ever before so that's competence and control um the control bit just to emphasize that is the controls that are decided must be in line with the guidance, in line with the latest thinking, that's sensible, all of those things, uh, in line with the hierarchy of control as well. So that's competence. Now, okay, we do all of that, have some fantastic controls in place at work, but we've still got to work on the employees and improving their understanding and awareness of what this current situation is about. You know as well as I do, there's lots of misunderstanding, there's lots of um, people saying things without actually any scientific backing. And so you need to make sure your employees are getting the right and the correct message. And that for us is about awareness. So what you've got to do in terms of awareness, we would suggest is to make people aware of the risks and the controls uh, before they come back to work, if indeed they are off work, or as I said, you know, before carrying on working. So awareness. Let's upskill them to understand what the virus is about uh, and what it means and actually how it's transmitted. And, and let's stop talking about uh, things people have heard, um, you know, a friend of theirs that told them something. You know, let's properly give them the awareness. Now, difficult, you might say, if, if you've got people that are working from home or are not at work, whatever it might be, there are, the best way to do this is to give them education before they come back to work, if, if that's where you are at the moment. So you can use things like e-learning, you can use things like virtual classrooms. You don't need to get everyone together in a room and brief them. Um, this is one of the key issues for our members. We've developed an e-learning package specifically aimed at this awareness point here, because really, you know, you can send it out, they read it, they test themselves, and it, and it gives them that awareness so they know what they're talking about, they know what you're talking about. So awareness is absolutely critical, I think. Regular communication, I said before, and you already know, this is a very fast moving situation. Things change all the time. So you must keep your risk assessment up to date. Uh, we know that, but also you've got to think about uh, keeping them up to date with what the latest uh, situation is. Okay, and then finally, uh, enforcement. So I just wanna to touch on enforcement here. What I mean by that is internal enforcement. So, um, you know as well as I do, if you have rules at work and some people follow them, some people ignore them, then eventually everyone doesn't follow them because why don't they have to do it and I do. So enforcement is, is you enforcing these rules that you have. They're not, they're not a joke, they're not there for a laugh, uh, they're important and they're proper controls if you've got someone competent that's developed them. So you've got to enforce them and so upskilling your supervisors in that way I would suggest is, is really important. Okay. Um, so at this point, I've talked about the culture of confidence there. What I want to do is just pass back to Jenny uh, for our second poll, Jenny, if that's okay. Thanks, Chris. Yes. So um, for our second poll, we would like you to tell us uh, if you have got a documented risk assessment that is specific to COVID-19 in place already. To 
couple more seconds to give everybody a chance to answer. That's great. Thank you. Let's see what the results look like. Um, again, really, really positive. Chris, 82% um, already have one in place. 13% no and 5% not sure. Is that what you see when you're um, out there talking to organisations? Uh, I think uh, not always. I think when we're out there talking to organisations, there's, there's quite a lot of people that don't have one or they might have one but are concerned whether it's good enough where do i start blank sheets of paper etc uh, and perhaps uh, we've got a really high proportion on this webinar of, of people that have got an assessment in place but of course this webinar doesn't represent the whole of our membership um so it, it's i don't know it was surprising or not it's good uh, that's all that matters so um so 82 percent of people have, have got a risk assessment so absolutely fantastic um I, I, what, what I would add here is that when we first started talking about COVID-19 along with everyone else, one of the things we said is, is really it's going to be up to, to the employees, uh, employers to manage, to have risk assessment, make sure it's proper. Because at the end of the day, the HSE uh, historically, certainly over the last few years, um, perhaps uh, haven't got the resources they used to. Uh, the, the number of people employed by the HSE has decreased over, over that period of time. And so it's, it's very difficult to imagine how the HSE would externally enforce this. But, and again, you've probably seen the news, but the government have in, uh, in invested 14 million pounds into the HSE. Um, and I think that is to allow them to increase their enforcement um, activity. But let me, let me add something there, okay? That is about, this is a very serious situation, doesn't even cover it, I know. So that is about the HSE enforcing and making sure people have done a risk assessment and, have, and that it's good. It's not about trying to make money through finding people. Uh, you know, it, it's, and, it, and it never has been. That's what the HSE are about, making sure from an external point of view that everyone has followed the rules because it, this is very important in this case, uh, obviously. So as usual, if they visit you, they will ask initially two questions. Have you got a risk assessment? Can we see it? And then they will start to look at, is it any good or not? And, and you know, clearly the government guidance is there. I think that they will be looking at the government guidance and saying, does your risk assessment follow it? So I think that is, uh, that, that is what is gonna happen. Okay, so thank you very much for, for response on that poll, it's, it's, that's good. Um, okay, so last point on, on this then. Um, I just wanted to talk about, I mentioned earlier on, um, different ways of educating people. So what our what our membership has um uh, through different lots of different channels has asked us to do is to provide some way of um increasing the awareness of employees without actually then coming together in, in, in big groups so we have specifically for that purpose have developed this uh, e-learning package so it's a package and again we'll share the information after this um uh, available to our to our well i suppose available to anyone um, but it allows you to increase the awareness, the understanding of your employees, and also talk about specific control. So really uh, uh, a good thing to look at. Um, it's specific to manufacturing course, and it's not just an e-learning course, it's a whole package of information. There's a template risk assessment on there, follows the government guidance, there's template policies, there's lots of different things in there which you can use in your organization to improve this uh, or to drive this culture of confidence. I talked about before. Okay, so um, now I, I know it's sort of against our instinct, but we're going to leave COVID-19 there uh, and just talk about some other issues uh, here. The first one, and I won't spend too long on this, but the next, um, if you like, the next thing we'll be talking about, I think, and perhaps we already are, is, is Brexit and how do we leave the EU properly? What does that mean in terms of health and safety? Well, I'm not going to spend too long on this, to be honest with you, and you've heard me say this before, perhaps. So this uh, negotiation is, um, is, is ongoing, I think, at a low level, but it will certainly uh, ramp up as we go on here. So the negotiation between the EU and, and the UK. Um, health and, a couple of things. Health and safety isn't mentioned specifically in this um, uh, mandate, uh, other than it says 
uh, the bit that's underlined there, this should apply to the following areas, fundamental rights to work, okay, that means occupational health and safety. So the negotiation must apply to health and safety, we would translate that as. Um, the most important part, the only other thing I want to say on this is, um, th these are the words that are, that are there, the agreement should include reciprocal commitments not to weaken or reduce the level of protection uh, effect afforded by labour laws and standards. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that the, if we take the UK, the laws that are in the UK, the regulations cannot be diminished, cannot be made less by, we, we can't have people at more risk because of, of that, the political, the, the, the sort of European situation. Now, if we just think about our laws, a lot of our laws in the UK, apart from the Health and Safety at Work Act, a lot of those laws um, are, are absolutely in line with Europe. They're from the original EU six pack. Um, and in the, in the UK, and it's not the case in the rest of Europe, in, in every country certainly, but in the UK, uh, risk assessment is what it's all about. Every single regulation there is talks about risk assessment. And, and in summary, I don't see that changing because um, if it changes, it would be, we would argue perhaps, depends what the details are, but we would argue, I think, that, that it diminishes the safety of, of the health and the safety of people. So I think things will carry on as they are. The regulations are good. They're based on the principles of risk assessment, the UK regulations. And so I think that will, that will carry on. Um, and, you know, and, and important to sort of just consider here that 80 percent of all prosecutions that happen in the UK are based on the Health and Safety at Work Act anyway, which is a piece of national legislation that, again, I, you know, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. OK, so that's the, the EU UK position. Um, as, as Jenny said at the beginning, there is a question and answer session at the end. So uh, if we need to, we can we can talk through anything else there. Um, OK, so. Uh, leading nicely on from that then, uh, I'm going to talk now uh, our usual legal update that we do here, and I know everyone's mind is on perhaps on something else, but it is, <coughs> excuse me, it is important that we as either health and safety professionals or senior people in charge of a business keep our, uh, our knowledge and our skills and our CPD up to date, and so that's the purpose of this next uh, 15 minutes or so. So uh, I'm going to talk about our, uh, a, a, a specific case. So um, this information um, we've arrived, we, we've developed in partnership with our, um, our legal partner called Squires Patton Boggs. Um, so uh, one of their directors there, Gary Lewis, has, has uh, given us this information that I'm going to talk through. Um, the case is uh, really about the effects of the sentencing guidelines and the way that judges uh, interpret things um, and, and I hope therefore you'll find it interesting. So, um, and, and we will share uh, as well a link to the sentencing guidelines after this, um, just so you can, you can read that if you haven't got it on, on your desk already. Um, so, okay, if we talk about the actual uh, case, but very, very simple here, uh, let's call the, uh, the, the defendant company D. Okay, so I'll just refer to them as D from here on in. So, uh, D failed to ensure, so far as reasonably practical, the safety of two of its employees. So, a standard section two of the Health and Safety Work Act uh, offence. And the details of that is, if you look at the picture on the right here, this is a washer. Um, and the activity these, as we'll see in a minute, the two people that were injured were undertaking was to clean. If you look at that hatch at the front there, is to clean that hatch. Um, so uh, you can see it's quite a confined area, uh, so presents lots of risks. A uh, couple of details, the washer was designed, manufactured, installed by a German machinery company, uh, became operation in 2014. Um, in 2017, uh, a group of technical engineers were supplied to work with uh, a couple of the defendants, mechanical engineers, uh, in terms of looking at this maintenance, um, um, overhaul, that sort of thing. Part of the activity required them to, to clean the drum. Okay, so uh, this is what the washer looks like outside. If you open that hatch, that's the picture we've already seen. That is the washer. Um, sorry, that's the tank. And then the bit that I'm talking about is that circular hatch at the very front. And you read these things, I think, these cases, and you think, why did they do that? I mean, that's quite a natural response here. But let me just share it with you, and, and you can ask that question yourself. Perhaps. So, um, uh, as it says, 
Company D, one of their um, uh, engineers reached through the tank uh, while the other one held the torch. They had to perform a cleaning activity of this uh, tank. They used a, a chemical called a product called Fast Clean. Okay, Flas, Fast Clean has a flash point of zero degrees. That means very simply that at zero degrees, it will produce vapors that are then explosive or flammable. Uh, liquid doesn't ignite, vapors do, as we probably know. So flash point zero, so basically all the time, um, it is producing vapors that can possibly ignite. So that's the situation. So um, bearing that in mind, the activity that was undertaken was to scrub the inside of the tank with a wire brush. Okay, now you can guess what's going to happen here. I don't think it's very complicated. You've got something that's got explosive vapors, flammable vapors, and you've got a wire brush on a metal tank. So, no surprise, um, unfortunately, that a, a flashback was created, and both employees, the one holding the torch and the one doing the cleaning, were significantly injured here. Uh, and when I say significantly injured, um, burn injuries, uh, perhaps, obviously. So, that's the case. Now, we fast forward now to the HSE getting involved, getting reported, etc., cetera, and, and move swiftly on to the prosecution here. So the HSE's case, what they first put across, and uh, it's clearly quite detailed here, so I'm almost reading from the notes of the trial, but um, the HSE uh, said here, let, let's start at the beginning, perhaps, uh, the company were regarded as a large organisation. So as you remember from the census and guidelines, there are three scales, large, uh, medium, small. So they were considered to be a large company. Remember that size is based on turnover uh, in a year. Um, so um, that's what we have here. They decided, the HSE this is, that they looked at it and they said there's no risk assessment. Um, that, that There should be one and it should look at DZEA, the explosive regulations and cost the health regulations. So there wasn't one. So they decided culpability is high. So if you can see the scale here, um, it wasn't the first time it had happened. They said it had been going on for a while. Um, so they also looked at uh, likelihood of harm being level B, uh, sorry, being high, and the seriousness of harm risk was level B, which is a, um, a, a permanent uh, or um, temporary condition which, relate, which makes it very hard for you to do your job. Those aren't the words, I'm paraphrasing what it says, but it's a very serious injury. So. Um, Level B, in terms of harm, high probability, high level of likelihood, gives us harm category two here. So starting point of 1.1 million pounds, and then you can see the range that you've got here. Okay, so that's where the HSE starts. Um, sorry, I should point out at this point that, that that's where they are. What they then found out as, as the HSE, as we talked about on the last, last update, they will look at your financial records, they will look at turnover. So they looked at this company and they decided, or they discovered that Actually, the turnover of this company was 450 million pounds a year turnover. And therefore they decided that, it's, that it wasn't a large organization. They were a, a very large organization, a VLO, very large organization. And the sentencing guidelines say that when you are a very large organization, you're out of this scale. In other words, you might remember that it says you automatically go up a harm category. So that's now where we are. So just because of, and, and, you know, it's fair enough, you might say, but solely based on turnover, they've now jumped uh, and doubled the level of fine, if we just think about starting point. Okay, so that was the HSE's position. So we're at 2.4 million pounds. Uh, not surprisingly, the defendant didn't agree with that. And they came in at this point. Okay, so really significantly different. Uh, why? Well, the answer to that is because they said the culpability was medium, because there were systems put in place that weren't sufficiently adhered to. You might have heard uh, that before. There was a cost risk assessment for fast clean, um, uh, but there wasn't a safe system or work specifically for the use in the tank. Um, fast clean was used all the time, uh, but it wasn't really used in this way. Um, there was a DZEA risk assessment, but it was for the whole company, uh, the whole site, not specifically for this. So they, and although that's a, that sounds like um, you know, almost creating a bigger problem. Their argument was that there were risk assessments in place, which is what the law requires. And that's why they said culpability medium, 
Uh, they didn't argue about the harm level, level B, because you can't really. Um, but they argued that the likelihood was medium, which overall gives us a harm category of three, and as you can see, a fine of £300,000 here. So not surprisingly, a big difference. Okay. The, the company went on to say that both of their employees were qualified mechanical engineers and had received training in risk assessment and COSH. There was no safe system of work, but on the canister it said, extremely flammable, keep away from sparks, use only outdoors in a well-ventilated area. So you've probably heard those warnings before. Um, and they were relying on that to say that, um, but I, I suppose that the employee should have followed that and uh, not done it, known better, because they were mechanical engineers. Um, they also said that this uplift to the next harm category, which in this case would have taken them up to 600,000, is not automatic. And they're right on that point. The guidance says it's not automatic. The, the HSE in this case still has to prove that that going up a harm level is actually proportionate to what happened. Uh, it just allows them to do that. Okay. So that's the uh, defence's response. Uh, if we move then swiftly on to sentencing, so we can see the two different areas that we've got here. And so uh, the sentencing was done by a district judge, Cheltenham Magistrates Court, July 2019. So the, the judge in this case accepted the prosecution's argument that culpability was high and that um, likelihood of harm was high and, and level of harm was never argued. And they adopted the large organization table. So if we think about that, then that ends up here. And now if we remember back, that's what the HSE said uh, to start with. So the, the, the judge agreed with the HSE, but didn't uplift um, because of the very large organization. And in other words, agreed with the defendant that that shouldn't be automatic. Um, it should be, is it proportionate or not? So that was, that's where we are. You can imagine here that um, the defendant, which, uh, who is talking about 300,000, obviously isn't happy with the 1.1, you know, probably not happy with, with the 300,000, but it went to appeal. Um, now, the appeal was January 2020, uh, and it gives you details of where it was. Um, and that's our starting position here. Now, in the appeal, the judge here agreed that, uh, actually agreed with the, um, the, the company, the defense, that culpability was medium, and uh, it did say that it was towards the top end of medium, okay, but said it was medium, which doesn't matter really if it's at the top end in this case, it makes a huge difference, as you can see between the two scales. So decided on culpability of medium, um, also agreed with the defence that likelihood was medium. It, it, and it really, I would suggest there that almost saying that, you know, just saying to people, here's a COSH data sheet, an SDS, um, and, and it says these three things on it, keep away from sparks, uh, well-ventilated area, et cetera, almost saying that, that that's sort of, you know, uh, okay. Um, no, it would be very clear that is not okay, we don't advocate that that's okay, but it seemed to be what the judge was, was thinking here. And, and, you know, they had training, or it, it, they were mechanical engineers, all those sorts of arguments. So the judge said, uh, agree with the defence, culpability medium, likelihood medium, harm category three, which takes us to here. However, the judge then looked at this very large organisation question. And unfortunately for this company, Remember when the trial started, their turnover uh, was 450 million pounds. When they looked at their financial records again um, in January 2020, that turnover had increased to 600 million. Okay, so what that meant in, in, in the appeal judge's eyes was that it should uplift to harm category two. So that's that's what happened. So that's where we are on the scale now. So just to recap, the judge agreed with the defense in terms of culpability, likelihood, and seriousness of harm, but I suppose agreed with the HSE that it should go up a harm category. Okay, so we now start at 600,000 and the range is between 300 and 150. Now, what is really important here, and maybe one of the points of this story, is that that's the starting point, but the judge can actually decide where the starting point is. And, and what the judge decided here 
was that because, uh, I mentioned before, medium culpability, but right at the top end, in other words, nearly high uh, in the judge's eyes, was the judge actually started at 1.1 million. So the judge decided uh, a starting point of 1.1 million. Um, and then there were arguments from the HSE about uplifting it and arguments from the company about downgrading it and making it smaller. And long story short, the judge decided that it was 900,000 pounds. Okay, so it ended up at 900,000 pounds. Now, so if we bring that all together, the original fine was 1.5 million. That was reduced to 1 million because of an early guilty plea. So you probably remember that if a company pleads guilty, they get a 33% reduction. Um, so that's um, that's what happened in that case. That was brought down to 1 million. So here we've got the um, 1 million pound fine being reduced to six, sorry, the 900,000 pound fine being reduced to 600,000. So overall, the fine was reduced from the original 1 million to, on appeal, 600,000. The real learning point I would take from that is um, this company really are relying on the judge's interpretation of, of what they had in place being correct and, and really there wasn't a risk assessment and in my opinion they were, were quite lucky that the judge agreed that um, you know a risk assessment official risk assessment wasn't required and they could rely on the data sheet um, I would really we would strongly advocate having a proper risk assessment the other part of this of course is that it it allows you to, to understand how the sentencing guidelines work. Okay, so I hope you found that interesting. I'm gonna move on quite swiftly here. And, and I just really wanna make one key point before I go look. Um, one of the problems in this case was around risk assessment and it was around awareness and it was around training. And this case didn't happen during this current crisis that we're in. But what I would say is, you know, it, it, initially everyone thinks that you can't do training, you can't do upskilling, you can't do risk assessment training. Uh, and it's very easy to say can't do it but to support our membership we have developed a, a new way of doing training and virtual it's the virtual classroom and i'm not going to spend too long on it uh, it's not what you're here for but we can share information on this with you afterwards but what i would say is it's not e-learning there's a tutor there's an experienced health and safety professional delivering the message your people can be at work can be at home wherever you want and they are then brought into a virtual room together. The course is run using uh, breakout rooms, so you can have syndicate exercises, you can run polls, um, and it is as close to face-to-face -to -face training as you can get, um, but it's obviously more uh, useful in this current situation. But we envisage this will be the way that training goes, because if you think about, you know, you can just have people anywhere you like, and they can join the training room rather than having to come to somewhere to be physically trained. So I don't say too much more about it. Um, there's a nice graphic that explains how it all works, but we can share that with you afterwards if, if you're interested. Okay, so I'm gonna pass back to Jenny now uh, and see if we've received any questions uh, that, that we can help you with. Thanks, Chris, yes, unsurprisingly, lots of questions have, have came in. Um, mostly are uh, COVID-19 related. Um, we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. Um, before we start, just to pick up on a handful of them. Um, yes, this uh, this webinar is, is being recorded and you will get a, a, a copy of the recording so you can view it on demand. We'll also send a link to the government guidance and the sentencing guidelines, as Chris mentioned. Um, and also you'll all get a, a link to the um, to our risk assessment template um, to be able to access that and um, and that e-learning package. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, wrap, wrapped all those up. And then some of the uh, technical questions. So a lot of questions around face masks. So Chris, I'm going to yeah. um, chuck a few at you in one go. Um, so uh, first point is whose duty is it to provide face masks? Um, and uh, the guidance is is quite vague. And so what is suitable and should we, as, as in the organisation, be looking to buy some in now? OK, so uh, the first question there, Jenny, whose duty is it to provide face masks? OK, so if you do a risk assessment and you suggest in that risk assessment that face masks are 
uh, the control. And remember I said at the beginning that there's lots of controls that we should put in place before that, and the, the effectiveness of face masks is, uh, is, is not proven. In fact, it's worse than that. It talks about them being not that effective in the guide and in other things you can read from the government. Um, but if your risk assessment tells people they should wear them, then it's absolutely your duty as a company to provide them. That's crystal clear. If it doesn't say that people should be wearing them, um, it, it's, it's the employee's choice whether they should wear them, and you can talk about actually how effective they are, et cetera. Um, and if it's their choice to wear them and you're not telling them they have to, then it's legally up to them to provide them. You might want to take a different view that you want to do something, but it, it, to summarize, it's your duty to provide them if you've said it's a control, if the employees are deciding it on their own um, around face coverings, then it's not your duty to provide. That's the law. You might want to take a different view in terms of just the right thing to do. Uh, did, uh, what was the second part of the question, Jenny? Sorry. Um, what is or, or suitable? Yeah, I think I think you've, you've broadly, broadly answered it. So, it was what is suitable and should we be buying? I guess you've yeah, well, the second okay. part of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, just just to, to emphasise that again, what is suitable? So uh, the government have talked about in their guide, uh, in, in guide, and it might not be in the actual guide. Certainly in guidance that I've seen, they've talked about um, an FFP uh, uh, three rated uh, mask, um, and uh, sorry, FFP2 rated mask. Um, so that's there is guidance around what FFP rating. But again, you know, the government are absolutely um, robust, I think, on saying that face masks are not the best option. And face coverings are a completely different thing. Um, there's no FFP rating. That's something that's made up uh, in terms of constructed, I mean, by uh, people and there's guidance on how to do that step-by-step -step guides on how to make face coverings from the government. Thanks Chris. Um, right moving on uh, another one that seems to be a common theme is around um, first aiders and emergency um, situations so um, where, where we need to have sort of assembly points for fire, fire assembly points things like that uh, and whether the guidance covers that and any any advice around those areas? Well, the guidance does touch on first aid, if we talk about that, first of all, it does touch on it. Um, I've, I've found, and we've put this into our e-learning package because it's, an, it's a, uh, a, you know, a, a sensible question, uh, of course, a common question rather, sorry. Um, there's really good guidance from St. John's Ambulance on this. So they talk about, um, a slightly different approach but not that drastically different of, of just making sure that everything is done that you can do from a distance um, and only getting close to the person if, if absolutely necessary but it doesn't say anything in there about not treating them um, and, and it talks about um, precautions that you can take so you can refer uh, to, to shortcut the answer I suppose here I would refer to the St. John's Ambulance um, website. You can do that directly or through our e-learning package. It links into that. Great, thank you. Um, the, the the next uh, question, again, a, a couple in on this would be, what, um, what do we do if somebody who has been in work tests positive? Okay, that's a, that, that's a difficult question, of course. Uh, well, a difficult situation. Um, if someone at work tests positive um, and that is given to you as, as, as proof, um, you know, there's, there's medical evidence that that is the case. So it's not just believed because there are symptoms, but there is evidence that is there that says that definitely is, is the case. Uh, it, well, you know, you've got to then assess how close they've been to other colleagues and you've got to tell other colleagues and they should then follow the government guidance, which is about uh, self-isolation if you've been in contact with somebody um, that, that that's you know that's a I don't know what word you would use very a bit of a nightmare situation for, for a company to be in but that's what you have to follow two steps get some actual proper evidence that that is the case and secondly then follow the government guidance on on self-isolation thanks Chris 
Um, so a couple more, just one on the on, on specifically on the guidance itself. Um, is does the guidance differ between England, Wales, and Scotland and Northern Ireland? Um, like some of the other guidance, or is this guidance generic across all um, the UK? Yeah, the, the government guidance is released by the government in and is applies to all uh, all the UK, uh, there, all all the devolved um, yeah. areas. Yeah. Thank you. But again, you know, sorry, Jenny. Again, it is guidance. Um, you know, you've got the laws that are in place, which are broadly similar, but the guidance is the same. So yeah. Thank you. Um, just, I guess, this one may be more of a matter of opinion. Um, but, but for you, Chris, where um, so the guidance it states that companies with over fifty employees are expected to publish the risk assessment on the website. Um, do you think that HSE inspectors will be reading these to assess whether to make a visit? Um. Uh, reading the risk assessment. Yeah, we, um, they're, they're published on their website. Is that going to be kind of the first port of call for uh, inspectors to be sort of re reviewing them before they decide who to go and visit? Um, I don't, it's difficult to say how the HSE will behave. Um, it could be. Um, I think, and, and like you said, this is my opinion, I think the point in the guidance is more about you communicating it with your employees so it's sharing on your website you know that's one way of sharing with your employees um when it says share it on your website it, i don't think it specifically says to external people uh, or not uh, i could be wrong but i don't think so and so for me it's more about sharing it with people as i mentioned in the culture of confidence model um, making people aware of your risk assessment and giving them confidence to come back to work. Um, it, uh, you know, to answer the, well, to give my opinion, uh, it could happen that the HSE will start looking at risk assessments, but I, I don't think, uh, my opinion would be no, I don't think that's the way the HSE behave, and I think they'd develop very quickly a very bad reputation if they did. That's my personal view. Uh, so, short answers, no, I don't think that's how they will drive in yeah. Great stuff. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're probably going to need to wrap up there um, as we've run out of time. Um, any questions that weren't answered, we'll uh, we'll we'll get back to you uh, and respond to those uh, questions. Um, so just before I close, uh, Chris um, has mentioned we've developed a range of support options that he's talked through um, to help you uh, create and maintain a COVID-19 ready and safe workplace, um, including the e-learning e briefings that uh, that Chris mentioned covering a range of topics, um, such as the social distancing, workforce management, um, and areas such as that. Um, there's our risk assessment and policy template. Then, of course, if you're a member, you can always um, seek advice and support from our experts. Uh, if you are interested in any of those options, let us know in the survey at the end um, and, and we'll get in touch with you uh, and get you connected with those those that support. Um, we will, uh, yeah, we'll be sending the recording of this uh, webinar out uh, shortly in the next couple of days. Uh, in the meantime and beyond, you can keep up to date with Make Your uh, on our Twitter and LinkedIn accounts. Um, please do submit that survey at the end. It's really valuable for us and will help us provide you um, any additional support you need. Um, so once again, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we hope that you found it valuable and that you'll be joining us again soon.